Um, so let me begin my small part in this uh, consortium by focusing on the disciplinary and the interdisciplinary uh, fields of comparative literature and translation studies. And my paper follows a kind of historical arc. Now you know why I'm very interested in historical things. Seeing these two fields as first together, then very separate, and then coming together again, and ready to undertake a number of projects in the future together uh, that are central to many issues, one of them being migration, and that's where I will turn to at the end of my paper. But let me then begin by just mentioning something that's come up a number of times, and that's the fact that globalization has so accelerated over recent decades, creating dense human and infrastructural interconnections that both bind and divide the world in multiple and diverse ways. And as we consider humanistic fields such as literature and translation in this global context, I think we can ask a lot of questions, and the humanities is something that's been self-questioning a lot these days. But one might simply be, what is the address of literary and translation studies today? Where are its geographic homes, its websites? Where is it on the world stage? Is it on the world stage? But we can also think about another the verbal performative dimension of the word address. What might literary studies and translation or the humanities more generally speak to today? To what aspects of the global might it lend its insights? And to whom should it address its words? So as I suggested, I'll begin this paper with a brief historical review of comparative literature um, which is, I think, a broad and self-questioning field. How many of you are involved with comparative literature in some way or know something about it? I think most people at least have heard. If not, just think of literary study whenever I say comparative literature, because by now, I think everything is pretty much the same in terms of its basis. But I'll be speaking historically when these differences were a little more important. Um, so I'll be talking about this field of comparative literature um, and it's one that's often described as a central workshop of the humanities because of its broad range. And based on this history and the field's increasing involvement with translation studies, I'll then turn to some recent developments in which comparative literature is extending its range and beginning to address the public sphere. And I take as my example particularly the question of global migration. So comparative literature as practiced in the US and abroad has had an active and very changeful past. And because perhaps of the various different emphases now current, and because of healthy debates about them, and we can talk about this later if you'd like, the field today does not generally claim to be univocal or to have a single universally accepted object or method of study. Rather, its breadth and variety are what are salient. As one major US university explains on its website, comparative literature is the study of literature and other cultural expressions across linguistic and cultural boundaries. Department offerings and research make frequent use of linguistics, translation, film, painting, music, philosophy, history, sociology, political science, and even medicine. Um, courses span the cultures of the world and historical periods from antiquity to current time." End of quote. Uh, the many voices of this expansive field um, have created what might best be called today a mobile network of approaches where both relationality and differentiation play a role. Relationality meaning not that we all get along well, <laughs> not really, but connectivity. Um, inquiring into texts and media as well as their transmission and translation over time, language and place, Comparatists frequently approach broad human issues such as race, gender, imperialism, and human rights, as well as more traditional literary topics. And in the course of wide-ranging inquiries, they also reflect theoretically, bringing new focus not only to what we read, but to how. And in this sense, comparative literature can perhaps claim to act as, quote, the laboratory or workshop of literary studies and through them of the humanities, um, a, a moniker given by Roland Green, who is actually an English major. So this is quite amazing. But in any case, it gives you the sense of now everything being pretty much um, uh, the way comparative literature was first envisioned in its breadth. But breadth coupled with reflective theoretical innovation have made this study of literature both energetic and protean over the years. 
Well established in a number of individual undergraduate and graduate programs and departments in the US, the Europe, and in many sites around the world, its methodologies by now undergird scholarship and teaching in departments of English, modern languages, cultural studies, and more. And if the metaphor of the laboratory or workshop may aptly describe the field, its arena has of course been extended by now to the blog, the website, and digital possibilities of many kinds. Here, hypotheses and results are shared and, and tested, and this is certainly one of the reasons why the American Comparative Literature Association's current report on the professions, it issues these every now and again, is displayed on its website and is particularly effective. It's no longer a report. It's a bunch of contributions by members um, around, around the world about what comparative literature might be. And it suggests the discursive, dialogical, and overtly experimental mode of this mobile network, allowing each reader to view and critically interact with different voices that comprise the multiplicity, perhaps the Babel, after listening to this website uh, about comparative literature, you know what I mean, this kind of Babel of the field. Indeed, comparative literature has extended its reach in these ways to many parts of the globe and incorporated new voices and insights. Within this relational, virtually conversational network, there seem to be several particularly active nodes right now. One is colonialism and post-colonialism, in spite of and in part because of all the complexity of that discussion. Gender, sexuality, race, and the politics of identity is surely another. Interdisciplinarity, including legal and human rights, also medical studies is another. Intermediality of the digital humanities, world literature, much debated, and <coughs> translation. And all are important, indeed essential, to the discipline as we know it today and uh, to the humanities as we know them today. But I choose to focus here on translation because, well, of all of these various important nodes of interest, it's most central to this conference. But more than that, translation has a particularly close, <coughs> if vexed, historical kinship to the discipline of literary study, and I believe an especially important role in its current, more global unfolding. So the most common and European inflected narrative of comparative literature's history, and there are many others depending on place, site, geographic site, political dimension you want to emphasize, but the most common narrative of comparative literature's history emphasizes the field's early expressions in 19th century Europe, funny we were just talking about this, where it initially served as an antidote to a growing nationalism. And at that point, it flourished in collaboration with translation, very closely in fact. But by the early 20th century, translation was deliberately marginalized in what had become a highly Eurocentric discipline that prized readings, quote, in the original, largely of, quote, major European languages. Only in the late 20th century did European and US comparative literature once again meet and warmly embrace the field of translation. And this happened well after translation theory had itself developed in distinctive theoretical directions. And I'd argue that this relatively recent meeting and reunion of comparative literature and translation not only resulted in a fruitful expansion of literary studies throughout the humanities to include new and previously less read texts and cultures, but also an equally important translation theory's own growing insights into ethics, history, and its active involvement in the world, that is translation studies' own active involvement in the world, has helped translate comparative literature into something far more worldly and more potentially transformative than before. So let's consider this change more closely, and this will take about a third of my talk, and then the rest will move on to more recent things. But in the context of, 19th century, of the 19th century's uh, wars in Europe, its emerging nation states, its rapid colonial expansion, ideals of transnational literary history augmented by an intensified effort to translate, so this is right at the beginning, contributed to what soon became a growing field of interest, most marked in Goethe's discussions about literature. Um, if not regular university study, there was no field of comparative literature, was of interest. And they played a role, though, in the building or self-cultivation of the cosmopolitan European. And together they marked out a way to consider literary and cultural issues 
at this moment of political transformation, a way that would consider national literatures as they migrated across national borders and linguistic differences, challenging but also enriching one another. At least this was the hope. And if translation played an essential role in early 19th century renditions of comparative and world literature, this partnership and the rangy cultural vision that sustained it soon began to dissolve as soon as comparative literature became an academic discipline. We have to worry about that always, the, the sort of fencing in one when something becomes an academic discipline. We have to all beware. But by the early 20th century in France, um, when it first secured a place in the academy, the field was already turning in positivist directions where only rapport de fait uh, between two texts, actual provable connections. Um, and two texts in two different European national languages could go by the name of comparative literature. And studies that attempted to include more what called general or world lit literature, and this was pejorative compared to comparative literature, which was the high level of study. Um, moreover, when studying such rapport de fait, usually influences <coughs> or contacts by letter, um, research was to be done in the original languages, most definitely not in translation. And this French school and its constraints, both on the global reach of literary study and in the uses of translation, long dominated the young field. And I must say that early 20th century German traditions of comparative literature developed quite differently and often concern themselves with oral cultures and folk cultures. So some of the things that are taking a, a much greater uh, profile in comparative study today. And though it might have provided a strong transnational force in Germany after World War I, that is, studies of comparative nature of, of uh, texts, at least in the hands of scholars such as Ernst Robert Kurzius, colleagues such as Leo Spitzer and Eric Auerbach were, of course, forced to flee during the Nazi rise to power. And migrating first to Turkey and then the US, they used their scholarly work to retrieve the European culture they'd left behind, if in a new way, and they also became instrumental in founding a US version of comparative literature. So what was this new world version that developed in the wake of World War II and its migrations? Um, developing at a safe distance from the warring European nation states, comparative literature in the US from the late 19th century to the earlier mid 20th century often offered a less overtly politicized and more idealistic view of the field. And this is what Susan Bassnett emphasizes. I think she's right. It clearly tended toward more open interdisciplinary practices. And one uh, scholar, Henry Wiemek, describes the field in 1961 as comparative literature is the comparison of one literature with another and comparison of literature with other spheres of human expression. So you already get this, this growing breadth. Yet in fact, the field of comparative literature in the US, as well as in Europe, nonetheless continued to concentrate for decades. And, and I'm even a product of this. I'm old, much older than all of you, but you know, it's in, in memory. We concentrated on the, quote, major European literatures to be read in the, quote, major European languages. And these tendencies were reinforced in the US by funding from the US National Defense Educational Act that supported strong European language departments in most US universities, and also by the post-war rise of the new criticism with its emphasis on the close reading of texts in the original languages. In this context, translation was not generally acceptable for teaching and learning in the field, and theorizing about it remained uninteresting or unnoticed. If we have any doubts about this, we need only turn to various reports issued by the American Comparative Literature Association, the ACLA. I'll spare you reading them, but if you have any time, sometime in the summer, you might want to take a look. This overt rejection of translation was therefore tied in part to this positivist philological expectation inherited from the French school, in part to the strong European language departments that were regularly promoted in the US and very directly, in part to latent ideologies that had not shed their colonialist bias, but also to some theoretical constraints. As long as texts were all European, they could, it was believed, be effectively studied with the theoretical tools at hand. 
themselves drawn <coughs> from the heritage of European philosophy, theory, and literary criticism. And this itself very clearly constrained some global impulses. The 1975 ACLA plainly puts it this way, we're still lacking the concepts and tools that permit us truly to study literature at the global level. These concepts and tools will gradually materialize. Well, now we can say they did. And in part, I'd suggest through translation theory itself. So now we're going to move into the sort of transitional years, because between the 70s and the 90s, I think most of you were born by the 90s, no? <laughs> yes, <laughs> um, comparative literature, a literary study more generally, um, and, and literary study more generally grew and changed dramatically. You're so lucky. Theory, um, largely but not only European, became a major interest and soon a defining feature. First structuralism and then post-structuralism, particularly deconstruction, revolutionized it transforming ways individual texts were read and how they might be read comparatively, and also bringing attention to language, by the way, in a new way that made it um, a fruitful ground for discussing uh, translation studies. It often did so um, through probing insights into this question of language itself. At the same time, though, cultural studies emerged as another strong, if sometimes conflicting, current, um, carrying with it a keen sense of historical and political context. And as the century progressed, not only did post-colonial studies and translation studies grow in importance, but so did gender and sexuality studies, new historicism, race and ethnicity studies, trauma studies. All expanded the global range of texts read, as well as the theoretical assumptions that one could bring to them. And in these years, a more planetary comparative literature also began to find expression in new comparative literature associations throughout the world. This sounds boring, but it's a very important development as we think about where literary study is taking place in the world and the perspectives this might bring. So in addition to societies in Canada and Western Europe and the US, active groups in Africa, China, Eastern Europe, India, Japan, Latin America, Taiwan, and elsewhere brought new perspectives to the field. This is, again, between the 70s and 90s. And the International Comparative Literature Association, which was founded in 1955, tried to bring these together, at least create connections among them, um, and encourage scholars to do some broad international projects. But focusing in part on their own complex literary cultures, these local organizations use their perspectives to see and sometimes to substantively revise uh, assessments of dominant European and North American literatures. And equally important in the same years, influential new work produced by scholars from other parts of the world entered the European and US centers, including books and essays by Edward Said, one of my teachers, Swapan Majunbar, Gayatri Spivak, and Mikhail Bakhtin, who of course read, wrote earlier, but his works were translated only during this period. Entering into circulation, disrupting past assessments, opening new insights into empire and post-colonialism, these texts vastly increased an awareness of the globe's many highly diverse literary traditions and began to provide new ways to read them. Though these several developments joined to radically transform the identity of comparative literature and its adjacent fields, making it far more supple and inclusive, only in the 90s did the field or the dominant Euro-American branch I've been describing officially embrace a more extensive linguistic and cultural reach, and at the same time, it opened the door to translation. Weird to think, this was the 90s. And at this juncture, Charlie Bernheimer's 1993 ACLA report, which may be worth reading, uh, made a disciplinary recommendation that reflected the dimensions of this change. It strongly advocated reading more literatures from more parts of the world. This was considered revolutionary. In order to do so, it insisted on more language learning, not only of a select group of European languages, but of other languages as well, as many as we could manage. Can't manage them all. But the report also registered, for this reason and others, a dramatic new openness to reading in translation. So finally, in the 90s, we were supposed to read in translation. And he writes, while the necessity and unique benefits of a deep knowledge of foreign languages must continue to be stressed, the old hostilities toward translation 
translation should be mitigated, end of quote. Um, and in contrast to the past, it further suggested that translation might even be one of comparative literature's long-awaited theoretical tools for studying the newly global sphere. If you remember, I mentioned that before. And indeed, it could, so it seemed, help define the field. Bernheimer says, translation can well be seen as a paradigm for larger problems of understanding and interpretation across different discursive traditions. He sounds like we um, This is finally happening. In short, and to conclude this historical narrative, by the close of the 20th century, a comparative literature that had for decades embraced a highly Eurocentric program of study had met translation once again and begun reconsidering what this substantially, um, substantial opening to other languages, cultures, and theoretical concerns might mean. Now, changes in the real world doubtless played a significant role as well as the increasing global reach of financial and military systems, as well as information technologies prompted a sometimes urgent rethinking of cultural, linguistic, and translation issues on a world scale. And as Emily Apter points out, 9-11 came as a powerful wake-up call to many scholars, and a new linguistic and literary effort at cosmopolitanism uh, began to be debated in the 21st century and in this context of war, <coughs> religious, and political confrontation. Due in large part to this, as well as to changing developments in the field itself, some of which I've tried to outline here, comparative literature reached uh, the turn to the 21st century with far greater engagement with more of the world's texts and with translation as an active partner once again. And comparative <coughs> literature could now accurately be described through its tendency toward encounter and relation with other texts and cultures, and its reach would be truly global in aspiration, and translation in its growing theoretical complexity would figure very prominently in this. So in this perspective, a more global literary study began to find its address or many different addresses within the world's context in the early 21st century. And at its best, it would heighten an awareness of different cultural and linguistic contexts, as well as their even more complex interconnections. Moreover, by this time, as mentioned, translation studies had itself developed a growing discipline in its own right, and one that had already moved theoretically from a predominantly linguistic to a so-called cultural phase, and interested at this point not only in linguistic descriptions of translation, but also in the role of translators and translation in different contexts, and therefore in issues of power, hegemony, identity of various kinds, empire, and post-colonialism. Clearly, it had mo very much to offer, but perhaps above all, it had a long-standing uh, emphasis on ethicals, ethics and the ethical dimension that was much appreciated within comparative literature and elsewhere in literary study, underscoring translation's relation to the other. Its renewed sense of history was also a plus, and its experiential engagement with language issues in broad literary and political contexts were appreciated. So all three made it easy, I think, for translation studies and literary studies to join forces, and they certainly did. So let me pause briefly on each of these sites of contemporary partnership between literary study and translation. For in their questioning of ethics and history, they encourage a stronger focus on individual texts, but also broad cultural and linguistic assumptions. And in their address to the particular question of migration, which I'll turn to at the end, they can engage very pointedly with the global sphere, keeping traditional humanistic issues of ethics and human dignity foremost. I mean humanistic in the, in the most broad sense. As we learned even in the 19th century, where many trace uh, translation theories beginnings, as we learn in Schleiermacher's writings, a translation stands, of course, in a pivotal but ambiguous relationship to the target language and its source. It can be appropriative and ethnocentric in its strategies, bringing a source text seamlessly but reductively to the reader. Here, homogenization and hierarchy predominate. But this is only one way to proceed 
Translation also has the potential to open a relation with the other, to transform selfhood as well as intellectual hypotheses through the experiential mediation of what is different and other, or labeled as foreign. So by producing an opening or a dialogue with another text, voice, and culture, translation is capable of achieving a very different ethical result, one more compatible with differences in cultures and attention to everyday human experience. It's perhaps above all this bit of hope for and action toward a more relationary, open, and indeed even disturbatory linguistic space that translation proposes. The roots of this commitment may reach as far back as 19th century Germany, and in fact, even further. It's for 21st century effects, when joined with comparative literature, particularly in its post-colonial work, have been groundbreaking. And in university settings, thinking translation can also use its insight to extend and revise the well-honed and previously Eurocentric mode of close reading in new, more liberatory and critical directions. Analyzing source texts and translations, we can note, for instance, not simply differences or losses, but what has been called the regeneration of the original that arises through translation. Benjamin speaks famously of the text's survival and afterlife in translation. It's not the first, but he spoke totally compellingly about it. An idea effectively elaborated by Derrida, who writes, translation augments and modifies the original, which insofar as it is living on, never ceases to be transformed and to grow. It modifies the original, even as it also modifies the translating language." End of quote. A translation can show, that is, an other side of the source, aspects of it that had previously remained hidden or unnoticed and in this sense, translation revivifies the target language, but also the language and the literary tradition, importantly, of the source. As close readers in a globalized world, we can ask how exactly this happens textually and why when we read source and translation together. Its effects are, of course, not always benign as we can note a variety of ideological frameworks and background narratives that come into play whenever we translate as when we write, and both being part of writing. But the analysis, the close reading, remains essential for understanding the complexity of translation and the ethical judgment at work in its production and interpretation. It's also in the context of an ethics of the other that newer, more complex descriptions of linguistic hospitality, mm. hostility, or simple hegemony have arisen. And these are now providing the theoretical setting for important work in the field of literary as well as translation studies. I, one of the things I want to emphasize is how important <coughs> translation studies is to literary study today. Even if you want to call yourself a literary scholar, it's now become a part of what you have to think about, even if not what you specialize in. And I mentioned here the essential writings of some people in this room, don't want to embarrass anyone, but <laughs> Michael Cronin, Loredana Polezzi, also Maria Timoshko, Eduard Lisson, who I think is a much neglected thinker on issues of globalization, um, Martha Chung, and many, many others. Um, naming is always problematic, because you can't say everyone. But I say many others and mean that. And here, through the work of translation studies and literature studies, the ethical agency of translators and the, the issues of power and social context surrounding their work um, are highlighted and embodied as sites for exploring, listening, research. Much more needs to be done as the virtual and actual locations of translation expand but many pathways have already been indicated. And the work I hear at the Lisbon Consortium, at least what I heard, I began to hear, as well as other work of my graduate students and people I know around the world, suggests that these paths are being pushed yet further. And it's, it's very exciting to watch that. So I want to turn briefly to this other legacy from translation studies, which me, to me is a, a kind of new way of thinking about history. Because thinking about language and the role of translation can also transform an awareness of literary and cultural history. This is at least in part due to the constitutive power of translation. In a very practical sense, translation underlies history. 
and at times dramatically constitutes it. As Bella Brodsky puts it, translation today is seen to underwrite all cultural transactions from the most benign to the most venal, end of quote. And in certain fields, such as religion and philosophy, translation's historical power is particularly salient. Consider, for instance, translations of religious texts that have themselves created powerful new interpretations and even religious institutions. Martin Luther's German translation of the Latin Vulgate offers a dramatic example. The Chinese translations and commentaries on Buddhist texts provide another, um, which Martha Chung has brilliantly described. Or consider the history of philosophy as it involves in modern times in Europe and the US. For instance, through <coughs> Heidegger's rereadings of the Greek philosophers and his retranslations of their primary terms. Or Derrida's more recent translations and reinterpretations of philosophical issues, such as the term chalev uh, for of Hegel, probably one of the most famous. Or in the different linguistic renditions and cultural expressions of the work of Karl Marx. Um, a translation history that one of my colleagues at Princeton mm -hmm. is working on. The Dictionary of Untranslatables by Barbara Cassin, now translated into English by Emily Apter, Jacques Lesra, and Michael Wood, tracks some of these particularly, you've heard of this, particularly intriguing, this is one way to think about this, intriguing translation histories. If you've actually read parts of this big book, you'll know what I mean with their many ambiguous turns that have in fact constructed what we think of as contemporary philosophy. These invite scrutiny and expansion to include many other cultures and languages and to rethink issues that they, that they um, bring up. But I think they, they give you some sense of how translation becomes constitutive of what we think in our world. The importance of the history of translation to a global literary history is only beginning to be explored, yet it has much to recommend it. Let me simply mention that each translated text has a story, indeed a travelogue, and one from which we can learn. In fact, in their quiet ways, such literary migrations through translation into different languages and cultures can sometimes be revolutionary. They can reveal something other than national hegemony, encouraging an awareness of the long-standing transnationalism and transtextuality of many acclaimed national classics and national literary traditions, and surprising uh, polyculturalism within inherited national cultures. An example such as The Thousand and One Nights is always a good case in point with its several translations across languages and cultures, translations that often include textual additions and transformations, a work of many hands in several cultures, Persian, French, Arabic. It changes over time and place to reveal the complexity of its history. But foundational texts of European cultures are also surprisingly transnational. Think of Cervantes' Don Quixote, which is a well-known example, or Dante's Inferno. Indeed, the Inferno reveals a particularly interesting and linguistically constitutive translational travelogue. And we could begin by following the winding trade routes of Dante's own translations, beginning with what he read from Latin and French and heard in various Italian dialects as he constructed a language. He didn't have one. He constructed it, um, a plurilinguistic vernacular that we today call Italian. But we could also <coughs> travel in another direction, looking to all the translations and adaptations of Dante's text that have journeyed over time, place, and by now some 70 languages. And the third step might be to examine how translations and adaptations have become interwoven with our um, recipient cultures, increasing the transtextual quality of their poetry. In the Anglophone context, we might look, for instance, to the work of T.S. Eliot or Derek Walcott, you can hardly help but trip over phrases from Dante as you read along, some noted, some not. But Dante appears prominently through this kind of intertextual illusion. Such translation histories can also be traced in the migration of poetic forms and genres, the sonnet, the hazal form, the haiku, all offer intriguing examples. Who and what made these literary conversations and dominations possible? Why did others not occur? Why did other forms not move in this way? These are big questions for literary history, and I think very interesting politically as well as, as literarily 
The real gain would, however, be to rethink the literary history of several global literary traditions, noting not their static qualities, but their adventurous encounters and interweavings that make us aware that literary migrations in the form of translation, transmission, transtextuality affect every culture, even the most seemingly pure, and even our own directly and often irremediably. So can you open? Is it, it's cold, but hot, I don't know. <laughs> but they make us who we are, and also somewhat other than who we think we are. That's OK. Maybe we shouldn't touch anything, because sorry. <laughs> this is historically preserved. <laughs> Maybe we can't open it. But they make us post-national, I would say, though not in the way that Goethe or the 19th century envisioned it. And they've done so since the very beginning of our literary histories. As Edouard Glisson has suggested, foundational texts frequently reveal a nomadism, complete with stories of exile and errantry rather than a simple rootlessness, rootedness. And looking to translation histories forcefully reminds us of their ongoing linguistic and geographic wanderings. Texts wander, their stories wander, if we look at them from the start, and the texts themselves wander. And such a story remains to be written. But some of the literary migrations have often been pointed out, and the ways in which they constitute our transnational histories noted. In such historical context, translation in the restricted sense becomes transtextuality and the basis for a heightened global awareness of our interwovenness. As I've tried to show, literary study, along with the tools of translation, has the potential then to suggest an address that extends more broadly, even historically, than usually conceived and filled with more encounters, and there are many more to find. And though we cannot pretend that it crosses into every culture of the globe, the growing use of digital as well as print materials and the migrations that these produce suggest that with open and inquisitive theoretical narratives, emphasizing hospitality as well as an awareness of hostility, a growing awareness and interest in different expressions might in fact affect the future. We'll have to see, it will depend a lot on all of you. But let me turn in conclusion to the aspect of translation and literary study that might be called its potential for engagement. In here, I'll look particularly to its engagement with the issues of migration. Migration, and I speak now not only of migrating texts and cultures, but of people, is clearly a defining issue of our global times, as well as other moments in our historical past, by the way, and is likely to remain one well into the future. It is, in a sense, the human face of globalization, expressing not only our much publicized mobility, but also the encounters and interdependence, um, the play of local and global forces that increasingly shape our lives. <laughs> Migration is often prompted by economic need, sometimes global, at other times quite local. It can also emerge, as we see today, from war, internal, political, and criminal disruption, or from ecological disaster. It's hastened by inexpensive travel and communication resources, typical of our times, and often propelled by the simple, all too simple, aspiration for a better life, a livable life, though it must inevitably deal with often discouraging international and national legal and bureaucratic requirements. These complex global issues affect individual human lives directly and dramatically, prompting changes in residence, language, and social context, in identity or identities, mm -hmm. education, and opportunities for human flourishing. It transforms individuals into effects, but also agents of globalization, part of what Apodura calls an ethnoscape, and what many describe as translated men, women, children, um, being, taking on the, the physical as well as the symbolic notion embedded in the word translation. As we know, large-scale human migration dominates many regions of the world, and the media flood us with images and stories of people on the move often with tragic beginnings and equally tragic ends. And humanitarian issues arise on a daily basis in Greece, Turkey, Africa, the Middle East, Asia, the Americas, Australia, <coughs> raising concerns not only about jobs and cultural solidarity, but also and very often about shelter, food, medical attention, and simple protection from harm. <coughs> 
In 2015, the United Nations counted 244 million international migrants worldwide. They're still counting for 2016. And many more remain uncounted, of course, and the number is rising. You all know these things. They're part of our lived history. For a comparatist interested in language and translation, the movements of people, their languages, and their cultures across borders immediately raise a number of threshold questions, intellectual and humanitarian. Some are speculative and statistical. Important questions about language use and translation, the dominance of English or Spanish or Mandarin Chinese or French, and the potential loss of smaller languages as local populations migrate to regions where the use of dominant language is required. Other questions are far more, pract far more practical and individual but equally important and theoretically interesting. Many depend on central issues of language and translation, fields often omitted or intentionally overlooked within the more frequent social science discussions of migration issues. Translation questions often underscore the importance of the linguistic particular in understanding the global and vice versa. And I think Michael Cronin's discussion of this kind of a different sort of microcosmopolitanism is very helpful in this. But let me mention a few of these examples. So some have to do with language proficiency. At the most basic level, we can ask, for instance, how not knowing a particular language affects the lives of international and national migrants, sometimes affecting their very survival. What are the most critical instances of this? How and in what specific context do linguistic translations occur? And what are their effects? Who produces them? How do different political and cultural power structures figure within them? And how do these affect the subjectivities of migrating peoples? Some linguistic proficiencies have a strong political and legal valence, intersecting with modes of national and global governance. Who is defined as a migrant, or a refugee, or an asylum seeker, or a guest? Think of Turkey. And what entities provide the definitions how do changing boundaries such as those within the Soviet Union and its dissolution or those resulting from European colonialism, as well as simple crossing of boundaries, bring new meanings to these legal terms? How does the clandestine trafficking of human bodies enter into this set of terms and calculations? And how do recipient communities react to knowledge of the influx of people, whether their coming is publicized in newscasts print media, on the web, or carefully hidden? How can human rights issues relating to migration be addressed, given the juxtaposition of starkly differing views of social organization in different nation states? And to return to our initial important issue, the different languages in which these are often expressed. Here, translation can be raised as a humanitarian need and an ethical question. Is the translation linguistically and culturally competent? And is it being performed in dialogue with, rather than in strict hierarchical relation to the speaker or writer? How are national identities, bureaucracies, and legal vocabularies being negotiated? And how does the migrant's status as an alien relate to her or his eventual categorization within legal and political systems? How can the migrant's own voice be heard within the translations required for official recognition and documentation. These are important questions in global culture since they suggest the interface between the mobile individual and the generally more recalcitrant responses of the state. And between these, within these, work the translator and the interpreter, the embodied individuals who often affect what linguistic dialogue might occur. Migration also places before us, though, issues of resettlement and education, Many of these, again, concern translation, both linguistic and cultural. How can migrants become effective agents in a culture and educational system in ways? <laughs> we need someone tall. <laughs> Pause. Pause. Metaphor is important, but so is the reality. <laughs>
Okay. Um, so my question was, how can migrants become effective agents in a culture and educational system in ways that allow them to live, to work, and reach their human potential? Just as important, how will educational systems in host cultures be transformed by these new groups, educated through their new languages and cultures? Some things I think about, I mean, I don't know if many of you know Princeton, but <coughs> we're in the midst of a big, we have a big migrant community, large, um, that's part of our community. So this is something I think about, how our educational systems, it's not just one way, being transformed. I hope in good ways, but it's always complicated. How is web-based education being used in camps and in urban areas, affecting the lifetime potential of refugees? There's so much work being done on this. And how do translations of literary texts, memoirs, music, and art arise and move within and through migrant cultures? And how do these translations reveal and affect broader cultural translations, identities, and cultural histories? Which texts are not or cannot be translated? And what are the specific reasons for this? In these and other ways, questions about language and translation reveal much about the nature of migrant and home communities, but also about the multiple roles that migrants play as family members, legal or illegal residents, job seekers, students, workers, targets of police activity, objects of resettlement and re-education, artists and translators, often self-translators. As some of these roles and observations already suggest, the linguistic effects of the migrant are also important, both as individuals and as representations. Um, displaced people are not only translated men, women, and children, but translating men, women, and often children. Um, migrants, that is, have historically been powerful cultural agents, as well as the objects of policy making or interventions. They're cultural producers and brokers between cultures, not just victims. And this emerges dramatically through language, writing, and the arts, um, as well as on the grassroots level. Think of the way migration has changed the human sciences, even in the relatively recent past. Could we imagine a history of modern democracy without Hannah Arendt, keeping to the sort of European side of this, since it's one I know best, or conservative argument without Leo Strauss, or comparative literature without Eric Auerbach, or my friend Edward Said, or Gayatri Spivak? What about the prominence of the literary memoir in the globalizing world, where memory so regularly draws with it well-crafted stories of migration and displacement, as in Michael Ondaje's Running in the Family? Or the powerful transformative role of language itself plays center stage in the work of Ngugi Wationgo. In all of these, migration can serve not only a connecting, but also a disrupting function. It disrupts older coordinates and dichotomies about language and citizenship, identity and otherness, <clears throat> borders and policing, gender, sexuality, race, ethnicity, human rights, and invites new kinds of discussions. It enforces new kinds of discussions, provokes ethical debates, resistances, memories, histories. As suggested above, migration can produce transformative effects on language. It can highlight sites of apparent untranslatability, be these sacred spaces or severely traumatized ones, but it can also serve as a springboard to linguistic creativity. Think of Dante in exile, moving from city to city, dialect to dialect, transforming and creating his own vulgare illustre, and he said he wanted to be a world citizen, by the way. Consider the creoles, the pigeons, the multilingualisms, in, in the US, the spanglishes, the chinglishes, as well as the everyday anti-grammaticalities and countercultural argos that arise as people move and languages intersect, intentionally, for instance, in the rap of Pitbull, are any of you Familiar with Pitbull? Okay, good. Um, or unintentionally in multiple language acts on the street. Such common linguistic results of migration can disrupt what we've learned to think of as given national languages as they underscore the strangeness of language itself and its relationship to the political order 
Through migration and translation, language today can produce, that is, surprising plurilinguistic and polycultural zones, spaces in which old connections are challenged, where multiplicity is the rule, where resistance is possible, and where something new, to quote Baba, uh, may be born, experimental works of art, new reflections on language, literature, nation, and self. Such linguistic effects of migration produce and change cultural history as they redraw the boundaries not only of languages and cultures within and beyond particular national and international addresses, an effect that is underscored by diasporic connections and remittances, by the way, there's, there's that, um, but also the borders of and between the disciplines in which we work, creating more transversal con conversations. This is important, too. And remember, I started with a disciplinary conversation. But here, there is space in which new interdisciplinary research and teaching can fruitfully take place. It's a space that we, all of us, can intentionally create in our texts and classrooms. There are, for instance, a number of experiments ongoing at Princeton right now in the Laboratory of Comparative Literature, and I expect this is so elsewhere. For example, what happens when literature's laboratory for the humanities chooses to change its address and do its research and teaching about language and migration in the context not only of the university classroom but of migrant communities themselves, locally and abroad? New insights into language and translation, as well as ethics, identity, and human dignity, inevitably take place as ways of research change and develop in dialogue with migrant communities and their own theoretical claims. Or just as dramatically, what happens when the humanities regularly address the social sciences, initiating a dialogue about the cross-disciplinary conundrum that is migration? And one can think of this in terms of climate change as well. I think that's another place where this can happen. But though news, social media, and political discourse underscore migration's centrality to the lives of students and scholars, indeed to all of us, in the lived history of the 21st century, <coughs> it's still most often viewed from within single disciplinary frameworks, most often economics, law, sociology, or demography. It's clearly a field, however, that cries out for broader collaboration. In such transversal collaborations, if we can start them, but I think they are now being initiated, students and scholars of the humanities might bring perspectives associated with their own fields to bear directly on central topics in the migration studies field or open entirely new vistas for research while looking for opportunities to reshape public discourse in constructive and imaginative ways. And this can at the same time provide an opportunity for the humanities too often cabined far away from the public sphere to contribute quite directly to its betterment. Such an effort can, for instance, bring attention to questions studied in traditional fields within the humanities and for which the humanities have already developed sophisticated theoretical approaches, not only the central questions of language and, and linguistic translation discussed earlier in this paper, but also others, I'll just mention very briefly. For instance, specific modes of artistic and literary transmission into, within, and beyond migrant communities. Or one of my favorites, the analysis of narrative structures that describe migration in very different ways, depending on where the story is told. If it's told from a government or political communication, if it's told by a journalist in a newspaper or in a book, or in literature, music, and art. How are these differently structured? How do they affect audiences? This is something that could make a difference. Or we could think of constructions and also flows of identity, including issues of gender, sexuality, race, and age, solidarity, and otherness, as these develop and change in different situations of mobility and precarity. Um, and many theoretical voices can, can be accessed here. Also questions surrounding the current description of undocumented populations. What does this mean historically and geographically? And here, address as well as language matters. Or the changing imaginary of the nation <coughs> in an era of internationalism. And again, address matters. This changes, um, are, these changes are very different, of course, in different places. Or the comparative ethics of different world communities hosting displaced population. Such topics 
have sometimes been investigated through the quantitative and empirical social sciences, but often not considered at all. And there's no reason that the humanities should refrain from addressing them as it expands its own intellectual resources and educational reach through dialogue and collaboration. So in ways such as these, literary study and translation have already begun to perform some very worldly work within their capacious and innovative laboratory of the humanities. Such efforts fit well, it seems to me, with these fields' broad, border-crossing remit, their interests in ethics and history, and their growing eagerness to engage with questions of language in the more pragmatic and local, as well as theoretical and general aspects. The interdisciplinary and often community-based projects that migration inspires into so many minds requires can help us theorize more effectively and innovatively as we also respond more humanely to the human faces that migration presents. And these new projects, and there are others, of course, um, and I will be eager to hear about them, will at the same time provide the humanities with opportunities to better address aspects of the public sphere that today need it most. Thank you. Thank you.